morning, uh, actually good afternoon. This is Marav Fine speaking. I am the program manager for member services at the Jewish Funders Network, which is a network of high net worth Jewish philanthropists that is global for all over the world. Um, we're really proud to have uh, Kojeko, uh, representatives from Kojeko speaking with, with us today. Roman Schmolson will be speaking. He's the executive director of Kojeko. Um, he knows so much about this, um, about this topic. He graduated from Wurzweiler, who's been at Kojeko for a really long time. Um, and he's going to be telling us about what Kojeko does, what Kojeko stands for, the Council of Jewish Immigrant Community Organizations, um, and what he's been doing to expand um, the ability of Russian unaffiliated Jews to engage in the Jewish community. We have Lara Traum and Michael Drab. I hope I said your name right. Um, both of whom are Russian immigrants who were consider themselves unaffiliated but are engaged through Blueprint, which we'll be talking about today, um, and know a lot about Kajeko and were participants in Kajeko programming as well. Um, Laura is studying at law school. She's at Cardozo Law School, and Michael is a software engineer at Audible. So you can tell me how I can get that, uh, that audio recorded book to work, hopefully. So without any further ado, um, Roman, I think, take it away. Talk to us about Kajeko. Great. Uh, Marav, thank you so much for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. It's really a pleasure for Kajeko to uh, join Jewish Funders Network and be part of this distinguished group of uh, funders. Uh, as Marav said, my name is Roman. I'm the executive director of Kajeko, which stands for Council of Jewish Emigre Community Organizations. It's a central hub in the Russian-speaking Jewish community of New York. And the mission of the organization is facilitating successful integration of the Russian-speaking Jews into American Jewish community while acknowledging and preserving the unique Russian Jewish heritage. And to achieve this goal, we support a number of grassroots organizations in the Russian-speaking Jewish community of New York as well as several initiatives that encourage Jewish identity exploration and strengthening for individuals and families and development of uh, a strong Russian-speaking Jewish community as an integral part of the American Jewish community. And uh, the theme of our presentation today is the power of the unaffiliated, what the Russian-speaking Jewish community can teach us. Uh, before we delve into the topic, let us briefly take a look at the Russian-speaking Jewish community of New York and the United States. So uh, the first slide that you see in front of you, who are the RSJs? Uh, as you may know, every 10 years, the UJA Federation of New York conducts the Jewish population study. The last two studies of 2001 and 2011 consistently show that there are about 216,000 Russian-speaking Jews living in New York. This number represents uh, 20 to 25 percent of the Jewish community, of the Jewish population of New York. Uh, while there is no concrete data about the number of Russian-speaking Jews across the United States, uh, the rough estimate is that there are over 750,000 Russian-speaking Jews in the United States, which represents approximately 14 percent of the Jewish population. Um, and uh, while many American Jews today trace their roots to Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus that were part of the Russian Empire, for the purpose of our conversation today, we are going to focus on two immigration waves of Jews from the former Soviet Union. Uh, the first smaller wave arrived in the late 1970s, and then for a whole range of geopolitical reasons, the Soviet border was shut again, and the Jewish immigration picked up again in the late 80s and early 90s. And the community that we are working with today is really you know, people who came in the late 70s and their children, and people who came in the early 90s. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, what do we know about this community? Uh, first of all, it represents the most educated wave in the history of, the, of immigration to the United States. Uh, this community has contributed significantly to the United States' social, economic, cultural, and political life. Yet for a whole range of reasons, the Russian-speaking Jews remain on the margins of the organized Jewish community. Uh, Russian-speaking Jews are not, frankly, quite in a rush to join the congregations of any denomination, 
or other Jewish organizations. Uh, let's once again take a look at the data from the Jewish community study. This particular slide that you see in front of you compares ethnic belonging indicators among Russian-speaking Jews and non-Orthodox American Jews. As you can see, Russian-speaking Jews are scoring higher on virtually all the indicators. Overwhelming majority of Russian-speaking Jews say they feel a strong sense of belonging to the Jewish people. They feel it is important to be part of the Jewish community, are very attached to Israel. They say that most of their friends are Jewish and say that uh, they would be upset if their child married a non-Jewish person. Uh, the next slide, the next slide is also particularly telling. Uh, the study asked the participants to ad identify their religion and denomination that they belong to. Take a look at the last. Uh, obviously, you know, there, there are uh, some Orthodox Jews, some conservatives, some Reform. But uh, please take a look at the last two numbers before total. So, 33%. Of Russian-speaking Jews say that they are Jewish by religion, but they are not a member of any denomination. And then the next line, 23% say they are not religious and are not a member of any denomination. So if we add those two numbers, we are talking about majority of Russian-speaking Jews, 56%, not really identifying with a religious institution or a denomination. Uh, so how do we compare those two numbers? They are very strong indicators of ethnic and cultural belonging, yet not, not identifying or choosing to belong to any Jewish organizations. As we look into the future, the question arises, how do we maintain those excellent numbers from the previous slide? Strong sense of belonging to Jewish people, strong attachment to Israel, strong Jewish ethnic and cultural connection without joining and participating in any Jewish institution. What are the needs of the Russian-speaking Jewish community? Right. So um, the social work literature suggests that a person's identity is a combination of three factors, affect, behavior, and cognition, the so-called ABCs of identity. The same principles we believe applies to the Jewish identity. It consists of how we feel about being Jewish, what we do, and what we know. As we can see from uh, previous slides, the affect, the emotion, the sense of Jewish pride is very strong among Russian-speaking Jews. However, when it comes to behavior and knowledge, most Russian-speaking Jews would score lower. Most have no formal Jewish education and are not part of the organized community. We believe it is virtually impossible to maintain the identity that is based only on emotion and feelings. As time goes by, knowledge and positive Jewish experiences become essential. Therefore, we identify the needs of the Russian-speaking Jews in New York as Jewish knowledge, Jewish practice, and not necessarily religious Jewish practice, and positive Jewish experiences. Right? Now, how can we achieve those goals? So we come to Kajako and what we do. And uh, to achieve these goals, we believe uh, we have to focus on three key aspects. One is integrating versus assimilating. Maintain, uh, two is maintaining unique heritage and identity. And three, enriching American Jewish landscape. Uh, you may know, uh, you know, we believe that it's a myth that the Russian-speaking Jews lack Jewish identity. And that because of a long period of living under a repressive system, Russian-speaking Jews are like a clean slate, tabula rasa. We don't know how to be Jewish, what to do. We don't know what we even don't know. Therefore, American Jewish community feels that it must teach Russian-speaking Jews how to be Jewish. Uh, if we may say so, such approach is quite counterproductive. People do not feel they want to be patronized. Furthermore, many Russian-speaking Jews feel that their own unique heritage and identity can add and enrich the American Jewish landscape. Uh, so what we are doing is uh, uh, supporting and funding quite a number of uh, programs that provide meaningful experiences, dialogue, and uh, developing future leaders in this community. Uh, we believe we are building a two-way street, a bridge, where a dialogue between the two parts of the community takes place and everyone feels heard, respected, and empowered. 
How have we succeed, succeeded? We believe that uh, the key to success empowering individuals and uh, focusing on do-it-yourself approach and supporting the grassroots efforts. Uh, yeah, there is a sense in the Jewish community that we know better what uh, the community needs, and if we just build the programs, people will come. From our 15 years of experience, we see clearly that uh, supporting the outsiders, supporting the grassroots is the way to go. And now uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a program that we are particularly proud of and fond of supporting. Uh, we are very grateful to two uh, partners, two funders who are making, uh, who are joining us in supporting this effort. It's UGA Federation of New York and Genesis Philanthropy Group, without whom uh, this wonderful uh, program would not be possible. The name of the program is uh, Blueprint Fellowship. And uh, uh, it's a year-long program for Russian-speaking Jewish adults ages 25 to 40. Uh, it helps people to explore personal and collective identities through the creation of Jewish community projects supported by group workshops, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, and a small mini-grant for each fellow to develop their own project as part of the cohort. Uh, the fellowship brings together a select group of Russian-speaking Jewish artists, in, intellectuals, and innovators to explore the link between the personal identity and creativity. Uh, uh, we are in the seventh year of the fellowship. It's very competitive. Uh, close to 100 people apply each year, and only 18 to 20 are chosen each year to be part of the fellowship. And today with us, we have uh, two wonderful people who were a part of the fellowship, uh, in, have been part of the fellowship in previous years. And at this point, I would like to introduce to you uh, Lara Traum. Uh, Lara is the daughter of Russian Jewish immigrants who came to New York in 1979, and she grew up in Queens. Lara graduated from NYU with a BA in Music, Literature, and Judaic Studies and is currently studying uh, for her doctorate uh, in law at the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law. Before pursuing a career as a lawyer and mediator, Lara worked with the Zamir Choral Foundation as one of their choral conductors. Lara is a frequent soloist uh, in venues such as Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center. And Lara is going to talk to us about her particular project and her experience in the Blueprint Fellowship right now. Thank you. Lara? Thank you so much, Roman. Um, I appreciate being part of this conversation. Um, to add a little more about my background, as a first-generation American rather than an immigrant myself, I think there is a layer of complication as well as a layer of relevance um, regarding my J Russian Jewish identity. Um, I grew up in a home um, with significant cultural duality. Um, my family came, as Roman mentioned, um, in 1979 from St. Petersburg. They had a very strong sense of Jewish identity, but that sense was, to a great degree, informed by their persecution and their experiences with that. Um, I myself, born in America in freedom, did not necessarily process my Jewish identity through that lens, yet I grew up with that understanding. So it created quite a confusing approach to what it meant um, to be a Jew. As a result of that, my own journey, um, it ebbed and flowed and was compartmentalized over the years. I was part of a, a melting pot specialized uh, high school in New York where identity is something everyone tried to avoid and, and get rid of. Um, I was then part of Hillel at NYU where I certainly connected with Judaism to some degree but felt that it was not reconcilable with Russian culture, my celebration of New Year's that involved a uh, pine tree with no religious symbolism and, and all of these other nuances of what it means to have uh, a holistic identity. Um, even though I worked in the Jewish music industry after college, even though I 
sang as a cantorial soloist and, and worked with Zamir, uh, which is a wonderful uh, choral organization, um, I still was not complete. It was only uh, much later that I encountered the organization Kajeko and the Blueprint Fellowship and realized how Judaism and music together can unite all aspects of someone's identity if presented in a culturally nuanced and cautious way. Um, as a Blueprint Fellow, I myself created a project called Meaning in Melody, Secret Identities Surrounding FSU Song Culture. Um, this project traced the preservation of Russian Jewish identity via music um, from the late 19th century through today. Um, I ended up producing an album as a result of this project called Crypto-Jewish Melodies, Semitic Sounds of Russian Extraction. And this created a historical, chronological education uh, piece through an album of 14 tracks. So these tracks were split into five sets that illuminated how musical tunes have been preserved through the Russian Jewish immigration story. Um, the first set contrasted liturgical music of a grandfather figure, Dunayevsky, who wrote for the synagogue um, in the Russian Empire to the popular music of Isaac Dunayevsky, who was actually the favorite composer of Stalin and quite unidentified, even though genetically connected. Um, I had a set that dealt with immigration, surveying the impact of Russian Jewish immigrants in the first wave in the early 1920s, um, where uh, George Gershwin and Irving Berlin contributed to the American songbook culture in a significant way. Um, and, and the album moves on. It moves through songs of war, relating Jewish music to Russian wartime experiences, uh, songs of childhood, uh, demonstrating the more open connection to Jewish melodies um, during the, the thaw of Soviet oppression, um, and also the modern day realities that re beyond the borders of Russia and the U.S., revealing how these melodies permeate the cultures of Israel, America, other countries. Um, this experience with Blueprint was not just creating an album. It was creating something that could serve as an educational tool. Um, I hosted a CD release where um, through educational narration and performance, um, we communicated to a pretty large audience a, a story and a narrative that they c could connect with. Um, this audience was largely unaffiliated, largely part of uh, the Russian Jewish emigre experience. Various generations attended, and everyone connected to, to these various elements that spoke to who they were. Um, so my uh, blueprint project was something that holistically put together elements that everyone holds within them. We all have certain creative, emotional, nostalgic senses. We all have uh, different cultures, different nuances. And if Judaism can permeate every aspect of who we are, that is how it survives and it moves on to the next generation. So uh, I found Blueprint to be an incredible experience. It united my own compartmentalized identities. It enabled me to share that with others, and it has been invaluable. Um, thank you for letting me share, Roman. Uh, Lara, thank you very much. And right now I would like to introduce our uh, second uh, grantee, participant of the Blueprint Fellowship, Michael Drobe. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Larry and Mike uh, with us today. Uh, Michael was born in Riga, Latvia in 1978 and arrived in New York with his family in 1988 after quite an ordeal in uh, uh, Austria and Italy. 
uh, which he will tell you all about. Uh, he was raised to become a professional violinist by his musician father and economist mother. He instead today works as a software engineer, as Marav said, at Audible.com. Uh, he lives with his wife and children and runs a family business on the side. Story Taylor is a video production company. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roman, for the introduction and for letting me participate. Um, so as Roman mentioned, my family and I emigrated in 88 and 89. We actually, um, you know, part of what led me to uh, the project that I created is our own immigration story. So we, uh, our immigration took us, it took 10 months, which was a bit unusual, but at the time, um, as uh, some of you probably know, the U United States was refusing uh, refugee statuses to a lot of the um, Soviet Jews, uh, and so my family was denied twice. And um, because of that, you know, the, the immigration took quite a long time, but the question of why were we denied was always on my mind as a child even. So, um, you know, my introduction to Blueprint was pretty serendipitous and really accidental where, you know, I was discussing this issue of, uh, you know, why were certain people denied uh, in a Facebook group where somebody mentioned that, you know, have, you know, uh, somebody mentioned their own stories and we went into this whole discussion about, you know, what it was like to immigrate and it really culminated in me just kind of throwing out there just saying, oh, you know what, this would make for a fun documentary, it would be really interesting to kind of explore this stuff. And then, um, you know, a friend of mine that I haven't spoken to in years said, you know, there's this organization called Kajeko that, you know, you should check out. They have this Blueprint Fellowship. And long story short, you know, I, I found out more information about it. It sounded like an interesting opportunity. I applied without really knowing much about it. And, you know, cause my identity at, the point, at that point was really, you know, a non-identity, as uh, Laura mentioned. It's very similar to that. Um, as a child, you come here and you want to kind of shed any identity and just blend in. And, uh, you know, once I came to this program and I met the people and I got deeper and deeper into it, I was incredibly impressed just by what they do and how they do it. Um, you know, the, the film basically ended up being a history uh, of the process of immigration during that time. It kind of goes into a deep history of, you know, why people decided to leave. What was the process like? Because many, many in the both in the in the Russian community and in the American Jewish community do not know that the immigration was really a so-called transmigration, where people had to go to Austria first, then to Italy, then go through these series of interviews. It was a very tumultuous period and a very unusual one. And the fact that the United States started denying people was uh, is largely unknown. So this is really a first uh, history of its kind. Um, there have been very few things published on the topic. And, sir, and nothing in terms of film that, that speaks about this period of time. Um, you know, and, and since then, it's, it's really you know, become a lot more successful than I ever imagined. I mean, the project was so um, supported by Kajeko and by the various uh, networks that, uh, within, you know, um, that it gained a life of, life of its own at this point. Uh, you know, it's been, the movie's been screened for, the, almost, for almost two years. Uh, it's had uh, over 30 screenings uh, all over the country. Uh, it's, been, it's been in uh, six or seven film festivals. Uh, and, you know, at this point, thousands of people have seen it. And really the most valuable thing for me that comes out of it, uh, at the end of, the, of the, a lot of these screenings, I'll do a Q&A session and people will come up to me and they'll say, you know, uh, you know, I saw your film at the last screening and this time I decided, you know, I needed to bring my whole family to see it. Or people will come up and say, you know what, now that I've seen it, I want to go and ask my parents about how we came here. So it really kind of fosters that communication and, that, and, and brings the story to life, uh, a story which a lot of people, especially of the older generation, kind of sometimes will forget or won't tell their children about. So Kajekla as a whole, for me, has really been a stepping stone uh, to interest in the Jewish community, because prior to that, I really wasn't involved at all. Um, and because I was so inspired and, and impressed by the experience of uh, being part of the Blueprint Fellowship, um, my immediate thing was to encourage my wife to apply, and she was uh, also a Blueprint Fellow the year after. Uh, we've um, developed kind of a similar attitude, and the two of us since started defining and redefining our Jewish identity and how we'd like to pass it on to our children. Um, and to that, we actually have made specific changes in our in our home we've implemented some tra Jewish traditions or our version of Jewish traditions but it's you know traditions were non-existent before 
Uh, we've uh, both become inadvertent uh, advocates of Kajeko, and we'll talk about the Blueprint Fellowship any chance we get, uh, and have gotten quite a few people into the fellowship, uh, or at least told them about it and kind of generate interest just because we feel so strongly about it. We've both uh, volunteered to be mentors for other Blueprint Fellows, uh, and since then, just because of be being in the, in the R Russian Jewish community, we've participated in other things uh, like uh, Schusterman Connection Points uh, and recently the Jewish Parents Academy and so forth. And, um, and we're constantly on the lookout for more experiences uh, akin to Blueprints just because it proved to be such a life-altering experience for both of us. Um, so, uh, Roman, thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, and I think just being on this call is also a testament to, you know, how, I'm sure that this goes for Lara as well. You know, we're not, we're not being forced to be on here. Like, the experience made such an impression on us that we want to advocate for this program. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate your kind words. Uh, please allow me to ask you, uh, I mean, you, you, you both have touched upon it, but, uh, you know, how has the Blueprint experience affect your Jewish identity? and your involvement in the Jewish community uh, since the participation. You've touched a little bit upon it, but if I can ask you to say more. Uh, Lara? Sure. I think um, Blueprint uniquely um, engaged all aspects of my identity and directed them towards Judaism. And I think that's what makes Blueprint something quite special. Um, it has impacted my ability to be Jewish as a Russian, um, or be Jewish as an American, be Jewish as a musician, and that all came together in Blueprint, and, and that was the significant aspect. It, it related every facet of who I am um, with Judaism and, and also showed me that um, unaffiliated individuals uh, fit within um, the tent of offerings when an organization is pluralistic. So when you have something like Kajeko, where you have a blueprint, um, various individuals can sit in that room and create things together and, 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 and really inspire uh, others. And, and it created a, just a, a consistent relationship that I didn't need to be, in, wear, be, be wearing my Jewish hat. Um, it didn't require just Shabbat or just synagogue. It, it could be everything. And as far as my current involvement now, I am actually um, really privileged to now be a member of the board of Kajeko. So that has been really wonderful and exciting, and I look forward to giving back to an organization that gives so much. I also sing with the Zamir Choral, um, and, and contribute philanthropically to a variety of Jewish organizations in the New York area. Um, I still perform Jewish music, um, but now it's truly a matter of realizing that I can teach and converse and, and engage in, in any, by using any aspect of who I am. And that's all thanks to Blueprint and Kajeko and Roman and to uh, Michael, who introduced me to Blueprint. I was one of those people that he mentioned. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lara. Uh, Michael? Uh, sure. So aside from the stuff I've mentioned, uh, you know, the process of uh, making this film, uh, you know, kind of forced me to explore this history very deeply and the history of my own family. Uh, you know, so, so that was one kind of, angle of connection to my identity that, that I really didn't have before. Uh, the other thing is being part of Blueprint. Um, as Lara mentioned, you know, the, the group of people that Blueprint manages to put together is incredible just not, you know, because these things are, the way they pick uh, their fellows works so well, not just because these people happen to be either talented or have the great, a great project, but they work well together. The, the, the kind of opportunity you get to just meet with a community of like-minded individuals that are also, you know, Russian-speaking Jews. You know, for me personally, you know, prior to that, I, I didn't have that community. I stayed, largely stayed away from the community. I didn't feel much of a kinship, uh, whereas here now I'm meeting people that are pretty much, you know, like me and that have the same kind of sensibilities and the same kind of desire to figure out where they belong. And um, really since then, it's been... You know, I'd have to repeat what I've said already, but it's been quite a life-altering uh, situation for me just because 
of the involvement in this community and, and learning about all of these uh, projects and, and efforts that go into building it and, and you know and, and other other people that are part of it and, and they're exploring it the same way that I am great thank you so much guys uh, so uh, you know the question to all of us is uh, what are the lessons that we've learned through um, you know through this wonderful experience through seven years of running uh, blueprint and the questions are quite, uh, you know, may seem quite obvious, but are also quite uh, fascinating. Uh, first of all, we've learned that being unaffiliated does not mean being apathetic or indifferent about your Jewish identity. Um, many Russian-speaking Jews, for a whole range of reasons, uh, you know, uh, remain unaffiliated or, for the lack of a better word, or unengaged. But, uh, you know, deep down, they are very much looking and thirsty and hungry for meaningful, positive Jewish experiences. We, we've also learned to empower the ideas of outsiders. Rather than uh, Jewish community organizations running the programs, we believe in uh, giving the opportunity to people in the community or outside of the community and uh, giving them the chance to, you know, to teach us something and to enrich the Jewish community. You know, the basic uh, social work approach, meet people where they are, you know, without being judgmental, without being patronizing, uh, and uh, you might be pleasantly surprised and uh, you'll learn quite a lot from that experience. Uh, providing resources and community network to people with ideas and uh, people, creative people, uh, talented people, works quite well. And of course, creating viral impact. You know, uh, since we started Blueprint, we've had 105 people go through the fellowship. Uh, 35, 35 of the projects are still continuing uh, beyond the first year, beyond their year in the fellowship. And we have a tremendous, tremendous group of alumni, Blueprint alumni, who are supporting each other, who have created a, a creative nucleus of the community and truly are revolutionizing and transforming the very face of uh, uh, not just the Russian-speaking Jewish community, but the New York Jewish community. So we are tremendously proud of this experience, and of course, uh, we encourage all of you who are on the call to join us uh, in supporting this wonderful, wonderful fellowship. Once again, huge thanks to UJ Federation of New York and Genesis Philanthropy Group um, for being partners with us. and. Uh, at this time, you know, uh, you might be asking, you know, how does this uh, Russian-speaking Jewish engagement model apply to you? You know, if, you, if your foundation uh, does not specifically support the Russian-speaking Jewish community, you know, what, what's in it for you? How does it apply to you? And uh, to be honest, uh, uh, you know, we, we, between us we joke that uh, if you can figure out how to meaningfully engage the Russian-speaking Jewish community, you can do it with anyone. Uh, um, you know, uh, if you substitute the word Russian Jewish in our presentation to unengaged or unaffiliated, you might be surprised that everything we said is still relevant and uh, important. Uh, so once again, thank you all for listening. And at this point, we would like to uh, to open uh, to open the conversation. Obviously, if you have any questions, uh, we are here. We are available. The Email address and the phone number are on the screen. We welcome all kinds of uh, phone calls, emails, and ready to meet and uh, discuss further. And at this time, uh, we would like to open the line to uh, questions. Mara? Yes. Thank yep. you so much, Roman and uh, and Mike and Laura, uh, for your thoughtful presentations on this, um, teaching us a bit about what it looks like to be first generation or an immigrant uh, growing up in, in the States, it's really, it's a really important part of our, of the Jewish population and a really important part of, of the work that we do. Um, so I've unmuted all of the lines. So if anyone has a question, you can come right out and ask it. You can also feel free to type it to me um, if you don't want to ask it yourself.
Um, hi, this is Alan Devek from Lit Tower. Hi, Mayrov. Hi, hi Alan. Roman. Hi, Alan. Um, hi. Uh, just a, a less question than comment and asking for, for further thoughts. I mean, number one, yeah, I loved your last point um, about if you can re <laughs> reach out to, to the Russian Jews, you could reach anybody. And but but also the, the way that Kojeko has seemed to approach it is. Um, with a very light touch and trying to, to give voice to the community and not to be patronizing. What, what strikes me is that so many attempts to engage unaffiliated Jews, and especially younger people, uh, are so incredibly patronizing. <laughs> and you, you know, do, do, do not recognize that you're dealing with you know, people who are often making important contributions in, in their own way. So that's number one. And number two, I'm just struck by the power of the arts uh, to foster this type of engagement. And I'm wondering if you think that, that this might uh, be more powerful amongst Russian Jews than, than you know, amongst the general Jewish population. Oh, well, uh, first of all, thank you. And uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, arts and culture are quite a, quite a tool, not just for the Russian-speaking Jewish community, but especially for this community. There was a joke, you know, when somebody comes off the plane and does not carry a violin, they must be a pianist, you know? Uh, right. <laughs> so, right. So clearly, you know, uh, a lot of people uh, chose arts and culture, you know, first of all, it was very popular in the former Soviet Union. Second of all, it was a way to express your Jewish identity for many people. You know, as Lara said, uh, Isaac Dunayevsky, who was the favorite composer of Stalin, but, you know, clearly incorporated in his music the influences of his father. You know, this is, this is a Jewish way to go. Uh, so a lot of people, you know, frankly, a lot of people come to Blueprint, first of all, with an idea. You know, they, they, nobody comes to us and says, I'm coming here to strengthen my identity or to be part of the Jewish community. Yeah? Most people say, you know, I want to explore it, I want to try it, but really, I, you know, here's my talent. I'm an architect, I'm a musician, I'm a book writer. Right. And then, you know, uh, you know, then the Jewish light, you know, then, then the bulb go, comes on and the, the light comes on. And uh, we've, we've seen some fascinating personal uh, transformations, really. Mm -hmm. so thank you for your work. Yeah. Now, are, are you familiar, I, I, uh, Mayrov, I don't remember Rachel's last name, <laughs> but who was trying to restart um, or, or engage Jewish funders around the arts and restart funding for, for Jewish artists. Uh, are you, uh, Roman, are you familiar with this or maybe somebody else on the call? Because uh, it would seem like this, this might be um, – not only a possible source of funding for Kajeko, but someplace where you could contribute to the broader conversation in the Jewish community around the arts and in Jewish philanthropy around there, the arts. There's actually um, really relevant right now is that we at JFN are working on um, development of arts and culture programming, and in particular, right. there's going to be there are going to be some sessions on that at our conference, which is happening mm -hmm. in San Diego in April from the third to the fifth. So you can. If for funders on the call you sh and who are interested in arts and culture and interested in understanding um, how how and where and what the connections are between yeah. uh, Jewish Jewish life broadly and arts and culture, um, you should definitely take a look at our conference um, our conference information and I'll send that out along with uh, the follow up to this to this call, which will also include some videos that we were unable to play for you guys um, about about Blueprint and the specific projects that were discussed. I also have a request here. Um, Roman, can you speak to some additional examples of projects that fellows have done? Um, and also, how, I, I'm curious about the sustainability of some of this programming. Like, is it, is it ongoing, long-term programming? Is it meant to um, sort of pick up on its own, self-fund, and self-perpetuate? Great, uh, great question. So uh, let me provide a couple of more examples of uh, projects. Uh, one was a film festival by Russian-speaking Jewish amateur filmmakers in New York. Uh, that took place. Uh, besides encouraging the fellows, 
we also try to connect them, you know, or the projects to existing Jewish institutions. For example, the film festival by Russian Jewish filmmakers took place at the JCC of Manhattan that hosted uh, the screening, you know, that whole festival. And uh, the beauty was, you know, the JCC said, look, who are all these people? We've never seen them before. You know, this is wonderful. These are not the usual suspects who go uh, from program to program. These are truly, truly unengaged, unaffiliated people. So uh, the film festival was quite a draw. Another example would be a shadow theater Purim spiel. Uh, we have uh, a married couple. Uh, one is a photographer. Another one is an architect. And they said, what can we possibly do, to, you know, to make a Jewish community project? So they've developed a, a huge sphere and projected a light. You know, it's a bit hard to explain on the phone, but it was quite fascinating. And used the Soviet cartoon music to tell the story of Purim. And taught the children, you know, engaged about 20 children uh, in uh, puppetry, in making puppets and actually recreating the story of Purim uh, with uh, with uh, puppets through shadows, and uh, you know that performance keep going uh, every year. It's a sold out performance once again at the JCC of Manhattan and other agencies. Uh, Marav, your question about sustainability. So as I've mentioned, 35 projects are still continuing. Some of them have formed their own 501c3s and are operating independently. Uh, we never support 100% of the project cost. So the fellows are expected to crowdfund or to find additional uh, financial support through other, through, through other opportunities. Uh, some, yeah, so 35 are continuing either as independent 501c3s or some have been uh, adopted, accepted by existing Jewish community organizations. Uh, for example, we had a Blueprint fellow who started a family program for Russian-speaking Jewish families on Long Island uh, as Blueprint Project, and now that group is uh, part of uh, Mid-Island YJCC programming. Uh, so the community said, look, this is fascinating. We've never seen these families before. We would love to have them as members. And uh, the JCC said, uh, come join us. You know, the the Blueprint Fellow became the employee, part-time employee of the agency and continues the project. So that that experience is flourishing. Uh, you know, another another one was a, was a theatrical production uh, by a group called Lost and Found. Uh, yeah, that was quite successful, and that became a Russian division of National Folks being a Yiddish theater. So, uh, you know, quite a few projects have been adopted by other organizations, and some are continuing on their own. So, uh, look, Michael's project, you know, it was a, it was a small grant of uh, about four, four and a half, five thousand dollars, and now he has, uh, you know, he had over 30 screenings, and has been accepted into film festivals all over the world, and uh, you know, has told the story of Russian Jewish immigration to thousands and thousands of people really around the world. Okay. Thank you so much, Roman. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? We have a couple minutes left, so feel free to add, add right. in. Right. So, they, so all the Blueprint projects are described at you know, our website is www.kajeka.org. And then you can click on uh, Blueprint Fellowship, and absolutely each one of the 105 projects is described there. There's a brief bio of a fellow and a short description of the project. And uh, when we choose the fellows, you know, uh, part of it is their idea. It has to be innovative and exciting. But then there is also a fellow himself or herself. You know, we really want to make an impact on that person. And uh, you know, some people come with, uh, you know, with fascinating life stories, so that's also quite important to us. Awesome. And so I'll be in touch with you so we can make sure to send, to send, that, around to, um, send that around to the folks on this call. Another question um, about Yiddish. Has uh -huh. this generation of young Russian speakers shown any interest in, the, in their grandparents' language of Yiddish? So actually, that, that's a very good question. Actually, this year we have 
two proposals dealing specifically with Yiddish. You know, uh, two two projects are focusing on Yiddish. One is a, is going to be a musical project, um, and uh, you know, another one has to do with uh, performing arts. Uh, we, you know, so uh, Yiddish plays quite a role. While yeah, you know, while nobody, uh, very few people are fluent in Yiddish, quite a few are showing interest. There's, you know, we do once in a while get requests for informal study of Yiddish. You know, not necessarily uh, to speak it in everyday life, but to have these uh, you know juicy sayings and uh, proverbs and things like that. So um, uh, you know that's important. Uh, another another interesting event we had uh, jointly with Yivo. Uh, you know, 12th of August is an anniversary of Stalin's uh, murder of uh, Yiddish poets in the former Soviet Union. So we actually have grandchildren of uh, some of the poets that were murdered in 1952 uh, living in our community. So, um, you know, that's a, two years in a row we are having quite a moving uh, uh, ceremony, commemorative ceremony of, uh, of those writers and poets. Wow. Very cool. Um, thank you. Roman, do we have any additional questions before we end? Hey, this is uh, Mike. I just wanted to make a little comment um, that I'm not sure that was completely raised. So one of the, you know, kind of, again, testaments to, to the effectiveness of the program and to just, you know, what it does for people is that a lot of people in the community, former Blueprint Fellows, are now, you know, myself included, you know, finding ways to give back, right? Because, because we, again, nobody's forcing us, right? Because we found this thing so valuable and so effective, you know, we, we've become uh, advocates for the program. So you know, a lot of fellows are now uh, trying to either through their projects or just directly contribute back to the program to, to, to keep it alive. Thank you. Okay. I think that's all for questions. If you do have any additional questions, um, you can see Roman's email here on the screen. I will be sending around. You, you can also contact me. Um, and I'll put you in touch with the right person. I'll be sending around a recording of this along with the videos of uh, these programs and any additional information that I think might be, we think might be helpful for you guys. Thank you so much for taking your lunch hours, most of you probably, um, to sit and learn with us about Kajeko and about the work being done with unaffiliated communities. Um, it's a great model for what we can be doing in the Jewish community as we're, you know, really moving into the 21st century, different models of, of working with different types of Jews from all different walks of life. So thank you all so very much, um, and have a happy holidays, everybody. Happy New Year. Take thank care. Thank you.